Our Old Testament reading comes from the book of Exodus. We'll be reading uh, some from Exodus 33 and then some from Exodus 34. Hear then the word of the Lord. Now Moses used to take the tent and pitch it outside the camp, far off from the camp. And he called it the tent of meeting. And everyone who sought the Lord would go out to the tent of meeting, which was outside the camp. Whenever Moses went out to the tent, all the people would rise up, and each would stand at his tent door and watch Moses until he had gone into the tent. When Moses entered the tent, the pillar of cloud would descend and stand at the entrance of the tent, and the Lord would speak with Moses. And when all the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance of the tent, all the people would rise up and worship, each at his tent door. Thus the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. When Moses turned again into the camp, his assistant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, would not depart from the tent. Moving then to Exodus 34, beginning in verse 29. When Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the testimony in his hand as he came down from the mountain... Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because he had been talking with God. Aaron and all the people of Israel saw Moses, and behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come near him. But Moses called to them, and Aaron and all the leaders of the congregation returned to him, and Moses talked with them. Afterward, all the people of Israel came near, and he commanded them all, that the Lord had spoken with him in Mount Sinai. And when Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil over his face. Whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he would remove the veil until he came out. And when he came out and told the people of Israel what he was commanded, the people of Israel would see the face of Moses, that the skin of Moses' face was shining. And Moses would put the veil over his face again, until he went to speak, went in to speak with him. You know, I understand that uh, it would probably not be reasonable for us to read the whole book of Exodus as preparation to uh, better understand the words of John, much less so the whole Pentateuch, that is the first five books of the Bible. Uh, it, it wouldn't be reasonable for us to do that right now. Uh, part of me wishes we would and could because doing so would help so much in understanding the context into which the gospel of john is written it would help us to understand it now we've read part of of exodus 33 and 34 already just a few weeks ago uh, about where the lord revealed his glory to moses by speaking his name And he said this, the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. And we've already said that that phrase, the steadfast love and faithfulness that's mentioned there. the, the, The Apostle John uses that phrase. He translates it into Greek, but he almost undoubtedly uses that phrase when he speaks of grace and true. But there's a lot more going on at this point in the Exodus narrative that would be helpful to keep in mind. This is where God spoke and gave the law to Moses, written on tablets of stone. It's where the law was given a second time after Moses broke those tablets in the golden calf incident. This is where the Lord will give directions on the building of the tabernacle. We had here the, the tent of meeting, a kind of proto-tabernacle, and then, and then God would give directions on, on the building of the tabernacle, a more permanent, though not permanent, place rather than the tent of meeting, right? A step in that direction toward what would be the temple. For our purposes today, this is where we learn a bit about what it looked like when God met with Moses, when he spoke with Moses, what, what it looked like and what 
happened to Moses himself. Moses was a mediator. He stood as a representative of the people before God. The, the, the whole of Israel would not go and meet with God, not directly, not in the same way that Moses did. Rather, Moses would go out, we're told, and people might go out to that tent, but, but when Moses would meet with God, when God would show up in this particular way, Moses would go out to the tent and stand there as the glory cloud came down. He was a mediator that met with God on behalf of the people. And we're told in that first passage of this, this proto-tabernacle, this tent of meeting where he would go, and how all of Israel would watch from their own tents, and they would worship when God came, but it was only Moses, we're told, who spoke to God. It says that thus the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks with his friend. Similarly, Moses would enter into the cloud up on Mount Sinai. He would ascend and go into the cloud, the same glory cloud. And there he would speak with the Lord. Now, in Exodus 34, when he descends that mountain, we're told that he didn't even know this, but he was shining. He had been in the presence of God, in the glory of God, and it changed him where he was shining. He was in some way reflecting something of the glory of God that he had encountered in the cloud. And as the Lord passed before him and, and Moses saw him and he heard him speak his name he began to reflect something of that glory in a limited way if you saw the face of Moses you were seeing a true reflection of the glory of God but it was partial and it was temporary and it had to be veiled at times but now, in the coming of Christ, one greater than Moses is here. One who Moses and the prophets spoke about. Jesus Christ, who is a better and perfect mediator of a better covenant. Who has come to not partially or temporarily or in a limited way reveal the glory of God, but fully. To reveal it to you fully, completely, in its fullness. Well, the, the sermon text this morning comes from the Gospel of John, of course. And uh, we are going to read from chapter 1, verse 14 to verse 18. You can find it in your pew Bibles on page 886. Hear the word of the Lord. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me because he was before me. For from his fullness... We have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. This is God's holy and inspired word for us this morning. And we began this series on John at the beginning of the year, the first Sunday of the year, and we're almost through the introduction that John gives to the book. Uh, but it's important that we take our time here. You know, it's possible, I'm not making any promises, it's possible we'll move a little bit faster as we move on from here. Um, we might not at all. <laughs> I, I can't make a promise right now uh, to do that. But it's important that we take extra time in this introduction, because as we've said, 
this sets up all of the major themes and points that John is going to make. He, he puts them all up front, makes them completely clear, and then he'll go on to speak of these different things that happen throughout the life of Christ and his ministry to, to show that these things that he says up front are, in fact, true. The Gospel of John is really made to be read and then reread again. It's made so that you, you keep going back, you keep picking up on, on more. And I'd encourage you, continue to encourage you to, while we're in this series, once in a while, uh, try to go through and read this Gospel because it will help you. But we're spending extra time because it, even if you don't go and read the Gospel of John right now, hopefully it, it sets a lot of this up in your mind so that you're prepared for a lot of them. You know, one of the major themes that John has is the superiority of Jesus to Moses. The superiority of, of who Jesus is, but also the, the covenant that he has brought, what he taught, what he teaches. This is something that you'll see over and over. Now remember the context that Jesus entered into, right? When, when he came and dwelt among us, he entered into a time when Moses and the law that he gave, and much more so than, than Moses and the law, but the, the, the man-made tradition that had slowly been built around the law and around what Moses had said, this had become seen as the supreme revelation of God. But in Jesus Christ, a greater word had come. In a sense, a greater Torah or law, a greater leader, a greater mediator had come. Truly, truly, Jesus Christ is the fullness of everything that Moses was and pointed to. Where Moses and his words were a shadow, Jesus Christ is the image where Moses and the law pointed away from themselves, he is the one they pointed to. Where Moses was veiled, Jesus Christ is the unveiling or revelation of glory. Philip, uh, one of the twelve apostles, we'll read of him later on, but when he goes and he speaks to Nathaniel, uh, another one of the early disciples, he goes and witnesses to him, and he says, we have found the one of whom Moses and the prophets speak. Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Moses, we're taught, ascended into a cloud on Mount Sinai. And yet, Jesus will say that no one has ascended to heaven, but only the son of man. Setting himself up as superior even to Moses. The scriptures, including those from Moses, speak and bear witness about Jesus. Jesus will tell the religious leaders of his day, you search the scriptures because you think in them you have eternal life, but it's, it's they that testify about me. Likewise, he goes on to say that there's one that accuses you, speaking to the religious leaders. When they say, do you accuse us? He says, there is one that accuses you. Moses, on whom you set your hope. For if you believe Moses, you would believe me. For he wrote of me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? So Moses and all that he wrote about, Jesus says, is about him. If you believed Moses, you will believe him. When Jesus multiplies the loaves to feed the 5,000, there are some that speak of, of Moses and how he gave them manna from heaven. And Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. I mention all of these, you know, beforehand, kind of foreshadow them as they, as they come later. Because it makes the point that Jesus Christ is the fullness of everything in the Old Testament. And that's what John speaks of here in these verses that we read, verse 14 to 18 of chapter 1. 
John, in this passage, points out that Jesus Christ is the, the fullest dwelling place, glory, grace, and revelation of God. These four things. Kids, I want you to listen. There are four main points today. You can follow along, okay? There are four main points of the text and so of the sermon. The four things are this, that, that Jesus is the fullest dwelling place, the fullest glory, the fullest grace, and the fullest revelation of God. We'll go through these point by point, but first, Jesus is the fullest dwelling place. Look what it says at the beginning of verse 14. It says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Right? We read uh, before of Jesus coming to his own or his home, his own things, his own place, and how he was rejected, but it was through that rejection that he made many to become the children of God. And so you have this language of family, of home. And usually when we're thinking of families and homes, we think of a house, a dwelling place. And that's what comes next. He came and he dwelt among us. And uh, where it says that he dwelt among us, he took on flesh and he, he dwelt among us. You could translate that rightly as saying that he tabernacled among us. He came and, and pitched his tent among us. He, he in himself became a dwelling place. If you weren't with us earlier in the series where we spent more time on the idea of the Word, uh, I'll simply say it's speaking of Jesus, right? That the Word is Jesus Christ. We learn that in this passage. But, but the Word, we're, we're taught, was in the beginning, was with God, and was God. And so this is saying that Jesus Christ is God himself. God the Word. We'll see it means that he is God the Son, the second person of God. The Godhead and He, this one, came and lived among us, established a new tent of meeting among us. He inhabited the same world that we inhabit. He belonged to history in the same way that any figure down through history, any person down through history, has belonged to history, has truly been. In the incarnation, uh, which is this is what we call uh, God's taking on of humanity to himself, becoming incarnate, taking on flesh, his being born of the Virgin Mary, his entering into the world, much of what we confessed earlier in the Nicene Creed, right, about his incarnation. This incarnation, in this incarnation, what we have is the eternal God, taking to himself true humanity. And this is a holy mystery. Not, not in every way. Some of it has been revealed, but, but especially what often trips up modern people when it comes to the incarnation is, is we want to know the mechanics of things. We want to know how something happens, how it works. And there's nothing illogical about the incarnation, the idea of of God taking on flesh, becoming both God and man. There's nothing fundamentally illogical about it, but it still trips us up because we want to know. We know, the, we know and can say clearly, it's not a mystery to say what happened, that God took on flesh, that he dwelt among us. We can say why it happened, that he came in order to redeem humanity, to redeem a fallen world. But the how is going beyond what we've been given and likely what we could truly understand. Needless to say, it's true. In Jesus Christ, we have one who is fully and truly God, and at the same time, he's taken to himself full and true humanity. That he is one person with both a human and divine nature that it's hard for us to understand because we are one person with one nature we know what that's like we know how we experience that but but this is beyond our experience 
it won't do to try to explain it away in the way that some have by saying, well, he left his divinity behind when he, he came and dwelt among us. A lot of his divinity, he just, that stayed in heaven. It wasn't with him. That's not, that's not true. That's not what we're told. Yes, in a way, Jesus concealed his glory for a time, uh, but he didn't stop being divine. He, he didn't stop being God when he became man. It also wouldn't do, as, as some have done, to say, well, well, he wasn't really a man like us, like, like real people. He was more of like an apparition. He appeared to be like a man, but he wasn't quite like that. No, he was, he was truly a man in every way we are, yet without sin. He was uh, just as Adam. He, he was the new or the last Adam. You know, it's funny, in our day, uh, you know, as moderns, it's really hard for some people to understand how it could be that, that a man from history could also be God. That's kind of where we trip up, where we stumble a lot of the time. But there have been lots of other times down through history where it's far more difficult for people to believe that, that God would become man, that he, would, that he was truly man. Because that seemed way more out of the question at different times than that he could be God. We get tripped up on this. But, but this is what we're taught, that the word became flesh. The eternal God, the Son, took on true humanity. He was incarnate, and, and in his incarnation, he dwelt among us. He tabernacled among us. He pitched his tent of meeting, his very flesh among us. And that should draw your mind back to what we read earlier. And so much more that we didn't get to read. Right? It, should, it should remind you that the tent of meeting, the tabernacle, later the temple, this is where God would meet with people. This is where God would dwell, would make his glory known, where people would come to worship him. This is where he would be present in the midst of his people. And just as he was then, in the tent of meeting, in the tabernacle, later in the temple, so in a much fuller way, in a greater way, to its fullness, he has now become present through Jesus Christ. As he met with and spoke with his people from the tent of meeting, so now he meets with us and speaks to us fully, the fullness in Jesus Christ through Jesus Christ. Now we could, uh, we're not going to do this completely right now, but we probably will at some time. I, I won't give a date because I have no idea when it would happen, but, but it would be good and right and we could walk through each piece of the tabernacle as God gave instruction for it to be built and we could, we could show how each part of God's dwelling place in the Old Covenant was meant to direct us to Christ in some way, that Christ is the fullness or the fulfillment of it all. That he is the incense, the pleasing aroma that lifts up our prayers to the Father. He is the bread of the presence, right? the bread of life, as he will say. He is the light that was represented in the lampstand. He is the Ark of the Covenant containing within himself the new covenant and representing and reminding us of God's continual presence and promise. He is the altar of our praise, the sacrifice for our sins, the high priest on whom, in whom we are brought into the very presence of God. All of it, right? Everything that was represented and foreshadowed about the dwelling place of God with man it has come now to us in Jesus Christ. It was all pointing to him. He is the fullest, the truest, the ultimate, the fulfillment of the dwelling place of God. Likewise, he is the, the fullest glory. I know we're this far into the sermon. We've only made it to the first half of the first verse of our text. But we'll keep going. Right? Verse 14 Again, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. 
John bore witness about him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes before me ranks before me because he was before me. This is the first time, but we see multiple times the, the use of the word full in some form, right? The full or fullness. That's what Jesus is. He is the fullness. And here we learn that he is the, the fullest glory of God. His glory is visible. We have seen it. In his dwelling among us, his tabernacling among us, just like the glory cloud would descend on God's Old Testament dwelling place, whether that was the tent of meeting, the tabernacle, the temple, the same thing happens to each when it was built. Now his glory is found in the person and work of Jesus Christ, declared to us in his word, shown to us, illuminated to us by the presence of his Holy Spirit. And his glory is the fullness of what Moses saw, the fullness of what Moses' face shone with. You could say that Moses' face shone with the glory that was ultimately realized in Jesus Christ. Remember that God told Moses that he would have to hide him in the cleft of a rock when he would pass before him. He would have to hide him, and Moses would still only be able to see his back revealed. That's all that it took for Moses' face to shine when he came down off the mountain. But Jesus is so much more of the grace and glory and revelation of God. John says, we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Full. This is the Son of God, the one and only. There's no one like him, and he is full of grace and truth. Where where maybe the grace and truth of God had been revealed before, partially, in shadow form, he is the fullness of that revelation of his glory and grace. Grace and truth, again, we've, we've said this, but I'll say it again. It's, it, it's so important to see this. Grace and truth is almost definitely John's way of summarizing the name that God spoke as he passed before Moses. Right? God declares to Moses that he is abounding abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. In other words, full of grace and truth. John is saying that what Moses just barely caught a glimpse of, a glory so profound that it scared everyone around Moses just to see it reflected in his faith. This glory has been fully revealed in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the glory of God that passed before Moses. He is the fullness of the light of God. And you, unlike Moses, if you have been brought out of darkness and into his marvelous light, he shares that glory fully through the word of Christ through the Spirit of God poured out. And so it reflects, it shines forth, it reflects from all filled with the Spirit. It it reflects in the love and joy and peace and Christ-likeness that you see in the people around you. It's reflected as you learn to forgive even the most brutal of sins against you because you have been forgiven. It's reflected as you point to Him and his glory, and his praise, rather than selfishly looking to build yourself up in pride. It, it reflects, much like it did from Moses, but in a greater way, in a fuller way. This is Jesus Christ making himself known in his word and in his people, his glory shining forth, reflecting just as it did in part, but now to its fullest. And he's more than that. Jesus Christ is also the fullest 
grace of God, the fullest revelation of God's grace. Verse 16, for from his fullness, we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. From his fullness, we have all received grace upon grace. Some, and maybe, maybe it's like this, depending on what uh, Bible translation you have, but some have translated this grace after grace, or grace in place of grace, but really grace upon grace, I think, captures the idea the best. Those others kind of capture it, but, but grace upon grace, I think, works best. That's what Jesus has done. He has come to fill out and fulfill the grace that was truly made known already in the Old Covenant. The grace given through Moses and the grace that Jesus offers, it it all actually comes from him, in other words. He has given all of it, the grace before and the grace after. So don't misunderstand. Some have taught that You know, in the Old Testament, you don't really have grace. You've got works, you've got law, you've got all kinds of of the, you know, revelation of sin, but you don't have grace, not until Christ comes. That's not, that's not true. No, it was all grace, and it was all Christ's grace all the way through. It just wasn't fully revealed, right? It didn't come in its fullness, in its final form until Christ himself dwelt among us. You shouldn't see in the Old Testament something that's wrong or unnecessary, unneeded for for Christians today. You shouldn't skip over the Old Testament to the good parts later on. Uh, No, it's all Christ. And all of it is for you in him. We could go further and say that, that you have not yet come to see all of the grace of God until you see it in all of his word. If you don't have the Old Testament, you're missing out on so much of the revelation of of God's grace in Christ. You don't fully understand Jesus yet. The Apostle Paul used the analogy of of a school teacher that the law was like a schoolmaster or school teacher kind of leading the people, preparing them to meet and understand Jesus when he came, to prepare us for his fullest revelation. But Jesus didn't come to replace something that came before, but to fulfill it, right? Grace upon grace, right? Not to get rid of something, but to fulfill it, to bring the fullness and be the fullness of all in all. There is grace spoken of and demonstrated and described on every page of the Old Testament, and, and Jesus is the fullness of that grace. It's about him, in other words. That's the point, right? All of the grace, wherever it is, and it is everywhere, it's all him. It's all about him. It's all from him. He is the fullness of grace upon grace. God's grace is made known in the law of Moses. Grace and truth, the fullest grace of God, has been made known in Jesus Christ. And the scriptures, all of them, testify to his grace. So Jesus is the, the fullest dwelling place. Kids, are you, have you been paying attention? Have you been following? He is the fullest dwelling place, the fullest glory, the fullest grace, And he is the fullest revelation of God. As the word, the fulfillment of the law, he is the greatest and perfected revelation of God. Verse 18, no one has ever seen God. The only God who is at the Father's side, he has made him known. We saw in Exodus that Moses spoke to God, and we were even told that he spoke to God face to face. The Lord used to speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. And that's amazing. And there's, 
There is so much going on there. But we know that he could not have spoken to God face to face in, in, in terms of seeing God in his essence, in his fullness. Right? God said that no one can see him and live. God told Moses that he couldn't see the fullness of his glory. He couldn't see his face. He could only see his back. I think that should make us think, how is he then speaking face to face with God? It is the same as the disciples did. What did Jesus say to them? I, I call you friends. He spoke to them. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father, he said. But Moses speaking face to face, it's, it was, again, limited. It was partial. We know that he couldn't see the, the fullness of God's glory, at least not at that time. Moses had an incredible intimacy with God. Right? That's what's being communicated when it says face to face and a friend. But here's something even more amazing that John declares. Jesus Christ is the very revelation and glory and grace of God. He is the very face of God. He is the word of God and so the fullest revelation of God. And so he is God speaking to you face to face. The face of God shining upon you. The the face, biblically speaking, according to, you know, uh, biblical understanding and ancient near eastern understanding the face is where you see the glory of someone it's where the somebody's glory most shines forth you imagine somebody with bright eyes and smiling and you know gregarious laugh and there's something of a kind of a you know a shining forth from the face that's what jesus christ is he is he is god's face made known to us fully truly completely he is god smiling upon you shining upon you moses as a prophet revealed god to the people but from a distance and outside of the camp or up on a mountain jesus is the revelation of god brought to you without a mediator and without a veil and without distance right no longer at a distance No one has seen God, it says, but the only God, the Word, Jesus Christ, who is at the Father's side, He has made Him known. This word that we translate, made Him known, is where we get our word exegesis, if you've heard that word, exegesis before. And I know I've mentioned this in a previous sermon, but again, it's too rich to pass up now. The word means, and you know, really exegesis means to make something fully known through careful explanation. This is what the scribes of the law were to do in the studying of the law and in, in bringing it to the people. It's what preachers are called to do today, to carefully explain and make known what God has said in the Bible. And John says this is what Jesus has done. In the fullest way, he has exegeted for us God. He has carefully made known to us and explained to us the character and nature of God. God has has been made known in him, so God is knowable. There's some times where you might feel like God is so distant, the very idea of God, I don't even know where to start, I don't know how how to understand it. It often feels like, well, maybe I pray, but he doesn't really answer. A lot of what he does seems confusing. And you might think, well, there's no way to really know God. But that's not true. You can know God if you come to him in Jesus Christ. If you look to Jesus Christ, if you hear his word, what you are hearing and seeing is God. He is God made known. So Jesus Christ is the fullness that fills all in all. He is the fullest dwelling place and glory and grace and revelation of God. Moses spoke with God face to face, but Jesus Christ is the face of God. He is the word of God. He is God. 
Moses was a mediator, but a greater mediator is here. Moses reflected a, a partial glory to the people of Israel, a partial revelation that he brought, but Jesus Christ is the glory and the fullest revelation. Moses gave the law to the people of Israel, but the law testifies about Jesus. And so, to him, to the Son, be all praise and glory. And may he, who fulfilled all the types and all the shadows, all the, the pictures and all of the words of what came before, so fill you, fill your home, fill this church, indeed fill the world with the knowledge of his glory. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, to you be all glory, all power, all authority, all honor, all praise. We do ask that as we've heard your word, as we've heard you declare, and in hearing of you, knowing that we, we hear the voice of God, and in seeing you in your word, by faith that we see truly the face of God, we pray now that as we leave, as we uh, walk out of here and so descend this mountaintop, that you and your presence and your glory, all by the presence of your Spirit, would go with us, and that we, just like Moses, but in a fuller way, would shine with that glory, with that truth and grace that you've made known. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.